Thanks to you all and thanks to the Department of Communication Studies for hosting me and inviting me to give the Hitchcock Lecture. So yes, what I'm going to present today comes out of one of the books that I'm writing, um, which is about feminism and war and empire. And what I'm going to ask you to do, that is those of you who don't study gender and war and empire and so on, what I'm going to ask you to do is something that might be a little challenging. I'm going to ask you to take a framework, a set of ideas, that maybe some of you believe to be true, that maybe some of you believe to be facts, and actually turn it on its head and give it some critical scrutiny. And I'm going to let the words of historian Leela Ahmed uh, describe what this framework is, and here's how she puts it in an essay from uh, 1981. She writes, quote, just as Americans know that Arabs are backward, they know also with the same flawless certainty that Muslim women are terribly oppressed and degraded. And they know this not because they know that women everywhere in the world are oppressed, but because they believe that specifically Islam monstrously oppresses women. Most American women who know that Muslim women in particular are oppressed know this simply because it is one of those facts lying around in this culture and most freely admit they actually know nothing about Islam or Middle Eastern societies. American women know that Muslim women are overwhelmingly oppressed without being able to define the specific content of that oppression in the same way they know that Muslims, Arabs, Iranians, or whatever, are ignorant, backward, irrational, and uncivilized. These are facts manufactured in Western culture by the same men who have also littered the culture with facts about Western women and how inferior and irrational they are, end quote. So you get a sense of where I'm going with this. And I start with this quote from Leela Ahmed from almost a quarter of a century ago because she captures in a nutshell imperialist feminism, which is the idea basically that there is us and then there's them, right? Today it's called uh, clash of civilizations. Earlier it used to be called Orientalism. It's a framework that says that we in the West are superior, we are civilized, we value our women, and they are backward, demonic, barbaric, misogynistic, and so on and so forth. And a central part of this narrative of Orientalism is gender and the supposed horrific oppression that Muslim women face. And imperialist feminism, the way I'm defining it, basically refers to the appropriation of women's rights in order to sell wars and empire. And what I'm going to argue is that, in fact, imperialist feminism neither benefits women elsewhere, nor does it benefit women right here. It actually hurts the interests of women in the imperial uh, center. And I'm actually, in this talk, going to focus on culture, I'm going to be focusing on uh, television, uh, film, tr travel writing, novels, memoirs, paintings, um, television news shows, and so on from the 19th century to the present. Not television from the 19th century, but you get the idea, paintings from the 19th century and so on, to look at how this narrative has changed and in what ways it actually remains the same. And I'm going to focus particularly on visual depictions, um, but I will make reference to other products as well. And thankfully, you're an audience of people who studies communication, who takes culture seriously. And I don't have to convince you how important <laughs> culture is in terms of framing our very identities, our sense of who we are, and therefore that it's important to critically scrutinize it. And I'll be the first person to admit how important culture is, because here I am wearing my Game of Thrones uh, jacket, um, <laughs> or maybe it's my Merlin jacket, I don't know. Uh, given the rise of Islamophobia in Europe and the United States, sometimes I think that people like myself who write about Islamophobia need just a little bit of magic, um, if for no other reason than to deflect the rotten tomatoes being thrown at us, I don't know. But anyway, culture is important and we need to take it seriously, and that's what I'm going to try to do um, in this essay. So let's begin with a moment that I think we're all familiar with in terms of the imperialist feminist uh, narrative and the very explicit tying together of war and women's rights. 
This is a quote from Laura Bush immediately after the events of 9-11 where she says, quote, fighting brutality against women and culture is not the expression of a specific culture. It is the acceptance <coughs> of our common humanity, a commitment shared by people of goodwill on every continent. The fight against terrorism is also a fight for the rights and dignity of women. So you see here, a very clear-cut connection being established between the war on terror and women's rights, and it's done very self-consciously, both in the United States, in Britain, and elsewhere. Now, the reality, of course, is that Afghan women were not liberated by the U.S.-NATO intervention, as many studies have shown. Um, if anything, uh, you know, the condition for the vast majority of women in the rural areas actually got worse. And this is not surprising because the people who would replace the Taliban, as Malalai Joya, the Afghan member of parliament and writer, puts it, the misogynistic warlords who would replace the Taliban really shared the kind of world worldview that the Taliban had. So it's not surprising that the condition for vast majority of women would stay the same or deteriorate. There were some improvements in education and healthcare, but overall, women are far from liberated in Afghanistan. And of course, Again, on another front, this shouldn't surprise us because it's not as if George Bush was a feminist, right? As scholars like uh, Zilla Eisenstein and others have written, the Bush administration's record on women's rights is appalling. Forget actually advancing the struggle for women's rights. We've actually seen attacks on women's rights right here in this country under the Bush regime as we have uh, around the world. But from a propaganda point of view, this image of liberating the oppressed Muslim woman was highly useful and it got used again and again. So much so, in 2010, when the US was getting ready to pull out, this is the cover of Time magazine. What happens if we leave Afghanistan? And of course, there's some controversy about this woman. Her name is Bibi Aisha, and it's not clear that in fact the Taliban are responsible for this violence, but she makes such a good poster girl, isn't it? She, makes the, she tells the perfect story from an imperialist feminist point of view. This is time again from last year, the return of the Taliban. Women want to vote, but the Taliban is not permitting them to vote, and so forth. Now. Imperialist feminism doesn't begin with George Bush. It has a much longer history that goes back to the late 18th and 19th century, particularly the context of European colonization of large parts of the world. This is the originary moment, if you will, of this narrative. And in particular, colonial overlords would talk about how backward oriental cultures are with respect to the treatment of women. So some of the themes that would come up are Chinese foot binding, child marriage and sati in India, gender segregation, the harem, the veil and the hijab in Muslim majority countries and so forth. And colonial overlords of course would step in to supposedly uplift oriental women. And I wanna tell the story uh, of one particular moment and this is British occupation of Egypt in the late uh, 19th century to give you a sense of how this narrative comes into being and, and who the various sources are that contribute to this narrative. So the British invade and occupy Egypt in 1882. And what you see from the chart that I have there is it's not just colonial administrators who use the imperialist feminist narrative to justify uh, occupation. In fact, this discourse is produced and reflected by others, such as European missionaries, as well as some feminists in Europe. And finally, it's not just as if this ideology comes from the imperial center. There have always been collaborators in colonial context who reinforce and reflect these ideologies. In particular, I'm going to talk about a man by the name of Qasim Amin. So let me say a little bit about what each of these forces actually did and how they contributed to this narrative. Lord Cromer, um, this is a man who has very specific ideas about Islam, about women, about the veil. He was quite obsessed uh, about the veil. Um, he writes that Islam as a religion is a complete failure and is responsible for the degradation of women. Um, unlike Christianity, he says, 
uh, Islam, uh, unlike Christianity, which leads women, which leads men to elevate women to a high status, he argues. In Islam, the practice of veiling and segregation lead Muslim men to degrade women and in the process wind up make them, making themselves inferior. And he argues that the solution to this is, quote, that Egyptians be persuaded or forced to imbibe the true spirit of Western civilization. So you can see quite clearly this is a colonial logic um, at work. But this logic is also reflected by well-intentioned Christian missionaries, right? Missionary women, for instance, who would write that they have a burden to go off and rescue their Muslim sisters who they say live in ignorance and degradation. And there are some feminists as well from Europe who would jump in on this bandwagon. Okay, what about uh, colonial collaborators? Hasim Amin is a French-educated upper-middle-class lawyer, and he wrote a book called The Liberation of Women in 1889, where he pretty much reflects, strengthens, and reproduces these colonial arguments. It's actually rumored that Lord Cromer asked him to write this book and possibly was present in dictating to him certain parts of it, but it's very likely a collaborative um, effort. What's the book about? The book has obsequious praise for the West and harsh denunciation for Egypt. And furthermore, despite its title, it is not about the emancipation of women. It's actually quite anti-feminist. Um, so Amin argued that Muslim societies had to abandon their backward ways and follow the true Western path of civilization if they are to be successful. And what was the way in which this was going to happen? Well, he said, Muslim mothers have got to follow in the path of European mothers in advanced societies and actually raise good sons, right? So you look, you do a, a, a critique of this, and what you find is that this rhetoric isn't about women's liberation either in Europe, in Britain, or in Europe. It's about a very patriarchal notion of the, a notion of the rightful place of women in these societies as mothers who are responsible for raising uh, good sons. Now, um, what happened as a result of all of this? Were women liberated in Egypt? No, of course not. In fact, Lord Cromer militates against and places all sorts of restrictions on women's education, and you know this proves to be a detriment to their advancement. Instead, Cromer and Amin would be obsessed by the veil and would insist that women remove their veil as a sign of their liberation. And those who would critique Cromer and Amin, and there are all sorts of uh, critics, I'm just going to tell you about what Egyptian feminists particularly the early 20th century, would say about this fetishization of the veil, what they argued is that what is needed to advance the cause of women's liberation was, first of all, access to education, the ability to work outside the home, access to health care, rights related to marriage and divorce, and that without all of these, simply taking off one's veil is really going to do nothing to elevate the status of women. <coughs> but as I said earlier, imperialist feminism has never been about women's liberation, either in the colonies or at home. Lord Cromer, I don't know if you know anything about this gentleman, Lord Cromer. As it happens, this great champion of women's rights in Egypt happens to be a founding member and president of the National League for Opposing Women's Suffrage back in Britain. Now, we can call him a hypocrite, but I, I really don't think he's a hypocrite. I think he's simply, as a colonial overlord, he was simply channeling and using women's rights as a way to justify empire. And back home, he upheld Victorian norms on what the role of women in society should be. So it's perfectly consistent the way he's behaving. And you see the same thing in relation to other colonial overlords, people like Lord Curzon, who was the Viceroy of India, and his wife actually did a lot of work to uplift uh, Indian women as well. And you see Lord Curzon actually praising her in one of his speeches as they're getting ready to leave and come back uh, to uh, the United Kingdom. And of course, who is Lord Curzon? Lord Curzon will come back to Britain and replace Lord Cromer as the president of the National League for Opposing Women's Suffrage. 
right? So there you have it. Um, all of the feminists who thought that somehow empire is going to lead to a bolstering of women's rights and suffrage back at home find themselves being betrayed by these colonial overlords. But I want to also say that imperialist feminism rests on a certain ideal notion of femininity. And what that notion is, is that, and, and this is a white femininity, this is a white normative femininity, and it's based on the idea that the role of white women elsewhere in the third world, in the global south, is to be crusaders for women's rights in the colonies because those cultures are backward, right, and in need of our upliftment. But back at home, their role is to be dutiful wives. And this is exactly the role that you know, people like uh, Curzon and Cromer and others ascribe to not only their wives, but to other women um, as well. Keep in mind, this is Victorian society. British women had few rights. They did not have the right to vote. They could not own property. They could not sue. They pretty much became the property of their husbands when they got married. There was no such thing as marital rape. Their bodies were the possession um, of their husbands. But for the colonial overlords, of course, this was the norm, and this was to be accepted. Now, I think that this narrative um, actually continues in the present as well. I'll just do a quick uh, jump to the present. I've written about Jessica Lynch. I wonder if you remember her story. She, her story is one of those feel-good moments when the Iraq war is not going well. And she is simultaneously presented as both a hero and a victim. The story is told that in this one encounter, she uh, shoots out all her bullets and she defends herself strongly. Turns out that's really not what happened, but she gets captured. And then there's this whole rescue attempt. She actually wasn't prisoner. She was in a hospital. They tried to return her, but uh, the US forces shoot at them. But there's this daring rescue attempt that's made. Coincidentally, the soldiers, the male soldiers rescuing her have cameras and night vision goggles to conveniently film all of this. You get the idea. I've written a piece, read, you know, read the piece. But here you have this hero victim, Jessica Lynch. The next time we hear of her is her having this Disney-like marriage to a Prince Charming. So back home, it's again a very sort of normative expectation of what is expected of our Rambo-type heroes who go off into other barbaric lands to vanquish the barbaric men. All right, now let me start at the beginning of this narrative. In particular, some of the precursors to imperialist feminism. Um, first of all, let me say that there is no single representation of gender or sexuality of the East in Western cultural or even political texts. Um, the picture that we get, and from my research what I see, is the picture is actually quite complex and contradictory. Um, but at least since the Crusades, there has been an image of the Prophet Muhammad as being this sexually lewd person. It was argued that he concocted this religion, Islam, as a way to justify his own sexual indulgences. And furthermore, by sanctioning marriage to four women, Muhammad, it was said, was using sexual profligacy as a way to destroy Christianity, right? It was a way to tempt good Christian men away from Christianity and to conversion uh, to Islam. So we have that image being set up in the 11th century in the context of the Crusades. But you look at some of the cultural products at that time and after that as well, and the picture is much more complex. Um, what we see is in Middle, East, uh, Middle English uh, romance novels as well as in travel writing, you have on the one hand the image of Eastern women as highly sexual and sometimes highly liberated. So in this uh, romance novel of 1324 called Sir Beavis of Hampton, uh, he is involved in a romance with this Muslim princess, and she's seen as sexually confident in, and, you know, as having desires, and she goes to his bedchamber to actually have sex with him, but, you know, Beavis being the, and I know you're thinking Beavis and Butthead, this is Sir Beavis, but Beavis being the good English gentleman that he is, resists her overtures and says, no, 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 I can't have sex with you, and then eventually she converts to Christianity and becomes the good Muslim, or I should say the good Christian, right? But you do have these images of sexual autonomy, sexual power, and so on. And on the other hand, in travel writing and in various other kinds of novel, you have uh, images of Eastern women as no better than slaves, slaves in the harem. Um, in fact, 
Um, in one piece of travel writing by this man, Vil William B. Dolph, he, he actually talks about you know, the horrific oppression of uh, Eastern women, and he uses it as a threat against English women. He says, quote, in his words, if the like order were in England, uh, as in his travels uh, elsewhere, women would be more dutiful and faithful to their husbands than many of them are. Right? So it's used as a kind of way, not just to control, right? Christianity and travel writing and so is used not just to control the autonomy and sexuality of Eastern women, but to control Western women as well. Um, and I'm going to show you a painting, actually, from the early 19th century that captures, oh, wait a minute, I have to still talk about uh, the Enlightenment. So you come to 1721, you come to the period of the Enlightenment, and the French Enlightenment thinker Montesquieu writes a novel called Persian Letters. He's channeling some of these themes of women in harems being absolute slaves and so on. But what's interesting about Persian Letters is that Montesquieu is actually not interested in the plight of Eastern women and Muslim women. He is using, as Joyce Zonana argues, the harem and, and women as a metaphor for everything that's wrong with French society. Right? Everything that's wrong with French absolutism. Keep in mind at this time, uh, the monarch held absolute political power, and Enlightenment thinkers like Montesquieu didn't want this. They wanted a republic. They didn't want, they were against absolutism. So novels like this become a veiled way in which to critique French absolutism. Right? He goes on to write a book uh, in, in a few decades after this where he would develop this notion of oriental despotism. And he would say that despotism is actually more at home in the Middle East, in the East, and so on. It does not belong here because white people and uh, European people are more at home with ideas of democracy. Now, all this is before the French Revolution. And in many ways, this is not just a critique of, uh, um, of French absolutism, absolutism. It's also prescriptive. At the end of Persian letters, you actually have a harem uprising, and the women take over, and they get rid of the uh, sultan, and they take on new lovers, and all the rest of it, and, and, the, and the woman who actually leads it, her name is Roxana, uh, you know, even says something to the effect of, give me liberty or give me death, right? The kind of uh, slogan that would become common in the context of various uh, bourgeois revolutions. At any rate, so this is some of the thinking that's going on. And then you also have uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, formative text of Western liberal feminism, Vindication of the Rights of Women. And in it, she argues basically that everything that is wrong with Western society, she calls Easter. That is to say, women, she argues, are treated worse or as badly as women in, uh, uh, in, in Egypt. And that this is an Eastern trait. I'm going to, I'm, I'm scrolling because I'm trying to find the exact quotes. She says, um, women's limbs and faculties are cramped worse than Chinese bands. Women are educated in the UK <clears throat> in ways worse than Egyptian bondage. And so the comparison to the East becomes a shaming mechanism of the West, right, and of Western men and so on. And instead of these similar conditions being used as a basis for solidarity, Wollstonecraft is simply using the East as a way to shame the West and to root out all that she sees in the West that is Eastern inspired, right? And unfortunately, that's not solidarity. So those are some of the precursors. Let me now turn to Orientalist paintings to show how they capture some of this language and solidify the Orientalist feminist trope. So this is uh, the famous painter Eugene Delacroix's The Dre Death of Sardanopolis. It's based on Lord Byron's play Sardanopolis. And this scene in particular is about an Assyrian king who, upon learning that he's going to face military defeat, orders that everything he owns be destroyed before killing himself. And you can see that in the image, right? You can see his possessions being thrown to the ground. You can see his horse being uh, killed, but then the women too are his possessions, and they are in the process of being killed as well. And this painting really captures visually the theme of oriental despotism, as Montesquieu uh, would put it, and it also captures some of the ideas that philosophers like Hegel would write about in relation to the Ottomans and in relation to the East, where Hegel says, 
The Muslims had their time back in the 11th, 12th, Middle Ages, you know, and so on. But now they have just sunk into uh, lasciviousness, lewdness, sexual indulgences, and that's why they're being defeated by the West. And you see that in a painting like this. Uh, the image of the Turk or of the Ottomans uh, is really what's being channeled here as being cruel, tyrannical, as treating women in a poor manner. And there are two visual themes that get established here. One is deviant male sexuality, right? He has many wives and concubines, and he seems, look at his posture, he seems completely unbothered by their torture and their death, right? So in that sense, he's deviant. Um, there's also, one could say, a hint of bestiality with the horse in the background, right? So that's one theme, deviant male sexuality. And the other is the oppressed Muslim woman, and particularly the idea of the Muslim woman as slave. And you see this more clearly in Jerome, again, brilliant French painter, Jerome's The Slave Market. Now imagine that you were in Europe at this time and you were watching this painting and you were viewing this painting. In part, you would have derived pleasure from the nakedness of this woman. You know, this was the Victorian era. This was the sexually repressed Victorian era. But you would have also been repulsed to see the slavery, right? And you would have come away with a sense of superiority that in our society, we don't do this. And therefore, it's the white man's burden to go off and liberate these poor women. The harem becomes an obsession, and the painting of women in the harem becomes an obsession. This is one of the earliest paintings from the 19th century of an oriental woman. It's by the French painter Henri. And you immediately know that this is set in the East because of the drapery, the silk drapery, the embroidery, her fan with the peacock feathers, her headgear, the hookah in the background, right? And if you look at the way she's posed, right, her body is posed in a way for maximum sexual pleasure of the viewer. Anatomically speaking, those who have studied this have said she'd have to have a million vertebra to actually be <laughs> positioned in that fashion because this is just not possible. But that's the whole idea, is to position her for the viewing pleasure of the audience, of the owner of the painting, and in this case, of the colonial overlords, because she's looking back at them, and she's saying, yes, you can look at me, you can possess me, and by possessing her, in part, you can read this as possession of the nation, right? Nations are feminized, and women come to stand in for the nation. This is not my original reading. Uh, this is reading that you know, people like Maleka Lula and several others have done of other kinds of imagery which is similar to this, what, <coughs> to this one. The next painting is Jerome, pool in a harem. By the way, I'm going to assume that maybe not everyone knows what a harem is. The harem is the name given to a separate living space for the female relatives of wealthy men, that is wives, concubines, but also sisters, mother, aunts, daughters. And it's a space where these women carried on their lives, right? Did all of the things that uh, people did back in that time. But that is not how the harem is actually represented in oriental painting. What you see, rather, is a space that is sexually charged. And it's really a projection of European heterosexual male desire onto the harem. Right? And so often, what you see in this genre is naked or semi-naked women cleaning themselves endlessly, waiting to be possessed by their husbands. And of course, there's a fantasy here going on of uh, not just you know having access to this many women, um, European men fantasizing about the access to so many uh, women, but there's also a, an implied lesbian fantasy at work here. Since this is a segregated space, um, and as we know, of course, lesbianism is one of the standard themes of male heterosexual pornography. And you see this more clearly in Ongra's Turkish bath, here you have what looks really more like an orgy than anything else. And in fact, if you look at the roundness of the painting, there's a sort of voyeuristic nature to it, isn't it? It's, it's sort of like a peephole, and he's looking into a space that he has no right to be in. 
and this is what he thinks he's going to find. Keep in mind, of course, that Western men would absolutely have not been allowed into the harem. So this is really the harem of their imagination. Because when you read the accounts of women at this time, they tell a completely different story. So Lady Montague, for instance, who accompanied her English ambassador husband to Turkey in the 18th century, she had access to harems, she socialized with women, and she tells a very different story. She says, in fact, uh, wealthy women are, in her words, freer than any ladies in the universe. Why? Because they had rights to property, which um, English women would not have for, you know, at least until the end of the 19th century. And as for the harem, she does go to a Turkish bath um, during her time there. And, you know, when she's undressed, the lady who invites her goes up and uh, uh, sees that she's dressed in a corset and is shocked by it. And she calls all of her friends to come and see the sight. And here's how Lady Montague puts it. She says, she says to the other ladies, come hither and see how cruelly the poor English ladies are used by their husbands. You need boast indeed of the superior liberties allowed to you when you lock them, when they lock you up thus in a box, right? <laughs> so she's comparing the corset to a box and evidently back, even back then, Western women boasted about how free they were compared to Muslim women. Now, if you look at the um, harem itself, it is a, well, I'll come back to this part uh, shortly. Okay, one last painting on the harem from the Orientalist genre. This is Delacroix again. If you take a look at this, it looks really more like a French bordello than the inside of a harem. And again, you have women who are passive, languid, sitting around, not being productive in any way, shape, and form. But what's interesting is how fair-skinned these women are, right? And of course, there are very fair-skinned Arab, Persian, and Turkish women. Uh, but these women could just as easily be French or British, isn't it? And in that sense, this is the, the work of fantasy. But in all of these paintings, you may have noticed that there is a darker-skinned woman who is always present. And we can say a few things about this. First of all, if you look at this woman, she's not sexualized, right? She's not sitting around half-naked and an object of desire. Instead, she's acting. But she's acting, we know, immediately from her skin color in a servile position. She is a servant. She is not a legitimate object of desire because on the hierarchy of desire and of desirability, black women fell very much near the bottom. And so you see how race comes to stand in for class in all of these paintings. And it's, it's both the class of the servants as well as the class of the upper class women. You know, there's a contrast that's being uh, suggested here. Now, I spoke about Lady Montague. I want to show you a painting by Henriot Brown. Henriot Brown, female painter, also has access to the harem. Take a look at her harem picture. Right? No naked women, no lounging around. In fact, Raina Lewis, who studies Brown's paintings, says this, quote, Brown's image of the harem as a social space contradicts the two most common themes of the Orientalist fantasy harem, sex and idleness. Right? Now, what actually happens in a harem? Well, uh, from the accounts that we have, Ottoman wives and mothers actually seem to exercise a lot of power through patronage networks that they had in the harem. We learned that they were well, well informed about international politics, they discussed politics, and they tried to influence their husbands uh, through the networks that were available to them in the harem. Uh, in fact, even today, ethnographers who study gender segregated societies such as Saudi Arabia are struck by the kind of spaces these are. We expect them to be spaces of oppression. In fact, one ethnographer whose work I wrote, she went to Saudi Arabia and she said, I expected to find you know, a whole bunch of really oppressed, sad sacks, and I was actually pleasantly surprised because the women she spoke to had developed critiques of their society, of male power, and when asked, would you like to go and live in the West, do you envy you know, women in the West, they would say no, because their women are isolated, they don't have these networks. And that makes sense in a certain way, right? After all, the second wave feminist movement, women got together in these consciousness raising groups to talk about their problems, to name their problems, and so on, in these kinds of spaces. 
That said, I don't want to sort of glorify uh, forced segregation. As a feminist, I believe that women should have access to every part of society and should not have to act through a, a surrogate or through a male guardian. And, but I believe that the way to fight this in places like Saudi Arabia and elsewhere is not to give our consent to imperialist feminism or you know, to praise monarchs who happen to be the allies of the United States, like the recently deceased monarch who was, uh, after his death, was called a feminist by uh, some people in the US government. These are not the ways for women to uh, for fight for their rights. Instead, we need a grassroots, bottom-up kind uh, of movement. OK, now I said earlier that imperialist feminism does not benefit Eastern or Western women. And I want to show how this happens even in the case of paintings. Now, up until the late 19th century, most of the paintings of nudes, of women uh, in the West, were of mythological characters, right? So like Venus from Roman mythology or Leda from Greek mythology and so on, regular women were largely not presented in the nude. But this changes. And I want to argue that Orientalist paintings and the paintings of Eastern women in the nude is what opens the door for this kind of sexual objectification of women in the West. And two painters in particular, Manet and Courbet, would actually specialize in these kind of nudes uh, of ord ordinary European women, uh, particularly prostitutes. So here's Manet's luncheon on the grass. I mean, this is a picnic. Why would she not be wearing clothes? <laughs> but there you have it. And this is Manet's Olympia. And you look at it, and of course at the time it shocked people, um, but how different is it from the painting I showed you earlier, La Grande Odalisque, right? And art historians actually have argued that the inspiration for Manet's Olympia is Titian's Venus of Urbino. And I want to argue that I'm not an art historian, but I want to argue that that is in fact not the immediate precursor. Rather, the immediate precursor are paintings like La Grande Odalisque and the entire harem genre. In short, the sexualization and objectification of Oriental women come back home in the form of similarly sexualized representation of Western white women. And in fact, John Berger, I don't know if you know his book, Ways of Seeing, analyzes the objectification of women in oil paintings and argues the kind of poses that you see, the techniques of displaying women as objects of the male gaze, would in fact be adopted by the advertising industry. Right? And this would become a problem that women in the feminist movement of the 1960s and 70s would actually take up and say that the dehumanization of women in art, in advertising, in culture is very much a crucial part of the second class citizen that women have in society. Okay, I'm now going to switch gears now to the United States, again to uh, advertising in the US. Um, in the late 19th century in the United States, we see a situation here where there is an excess of productivity and not enough people to buy the goods that are being made. This is when advertising comes in. And part of the way in which um, the elite classes would try to get Americans to buy more things and to become more consumerist is to use oriental imagery, right? Because it's a long history of the East and of the Orient as being this place of luxury and sensuousness and excess and so on. And here is how Melanie McAllister puts it. She says, quote, store displays highlighted the link between shopping and sensuousness or sexuality, both of which were or associated with the Orient. Harem scenes, Japanese gardens, Persian carpets and fabrics, stores decorated as mosques or desert oases. The Orient was everywhere in these consumerist stagings, right? And the idea was to say, get over your puritanism and your frugality, go out and enjoy yourself uh, by buying uh, these kinds of goods. And Hollywood films would pick up and reinforce these themes. Hollywood would learn very much from the language of Orientalism uh, in Europe, and you see films like The Arab, Cleopatra, The Sheikh, and so on, coming into being with these Orientalist themes. Now, the next clip I'm going to show you, um, this is from the film The Sheikh, but I want to say a few things about this clip before I show it to you. 
Because at the same time that you're seeing sexuality being orientalized, there is this rise of this idea of the new woman. Have people heard of the new woman uh, image that comes into being in the progressive era? Uh, remember, this is the time when women get the right to vote in the US. Margaret Sanger is championing birth control. Women are working outside the home. There are divorce laws and so on. And the new woman is basically defined as someone who is financially independent, who has the right to vote, and so on. And silent films start to represent this woman both as admirable and as a threat. Right? Um, and usually, this gets played out through the imagery of Orientalism. And in fact, this is the period where strong women come to be represented as vamps right? and as a threat uh, uh, that's posed by strong women. Anyway. Uh, this next clip is uh, a film called The Shake, um, and in the novel by this name, it's about a English woman who goes off to the Middle East to, you know, seek adventure, and she gets raped. Uh, in the in the film, she's not raped, but I want you to take a look at this scene where there is suggested rape, and see how she behaves. So there you have it, this funky new woman standing up for herself in ways that women in other films of this period didn't. So if you have seen a film called Birth of a Nation, where again there is an attempted rape, uh, a black man is chasing this woman up a hill, and instead of standing up for herself, of course, she flings herself off the uh, hill to her death only so that white men, particularly from the Ku Klux Klan, could come in and rescue her. And of course, there's a long history of this image of brown and black men, you know, going all the way back to Native Americans and the rescue narrative as being, you know, lascivious and wanting to rape and possess uh, white women, but displaced from their national context, right? The new woman can be spunky, can be a, a, a proto-feminist. Now, um, of course, by the time we come to the Second World War era, the idea of the new woman is all but gone, and she's replaced by June Cleaver and you know, um, wives and, um, and so on of that sort. And so the imagery of white woman as victim also comes into being at that point. But particularly after the oil crisis of the early 1970s, you see a whole slew of Hollywood films that present Arab men as being sexually deviant and unable to control their lust for white women. And also they have a lot of money and can buy uh, white women. So um, here is a clip from the documentary Real Bad Arabs. One actor who excels in his portrayal of Arabs as buffoons is Jamie Farr in Cannonball Run 2. I have a weakness for blondes and women without mustaches. All the stereotypes are here. Too rich and stupid to know the value of money. Give me 12 sweets. Better yet, the entire floor. And, and of course, he's oversexed, lecherous, uncontrollably obsessed with the American woman. Here, my desert blossom, give the change. Have you ever considered joining a harem? And so another pattern is the lecherous Arab. 
In Joel of the Nah, Sheikh Omar tricks Kathleen Turner. How? He convinces her to come with him to Arab land. Then he imprisons her. You stay here and you write what I tell you to write. We see the same sort of ominous seduction and protocol. The entire plot revolves around an Arab emir's infatuation with the blonde, blue-eyed Goldie Hawn. In the Bond film, Never Say Never Again, Kim Basinger is abused by the most sleazy-looking Arabs imaginable. She's tied to a pole, stripped to her underwear, and auctioned off to primitive-looking Bedouins. And in Sahara, Brooke Shields is also kidnapped and presented to the lecherous Arab sheikh for his own perverted pleasure. Get away from me, you dirty More than 300 movies, nearly. So you see, you know, some of these good examples of these sorts of films, and the culmination of this genre is a film called Not Without My Daughter, starring Sally Field, where she goes off to Iran and she's kept there against her wishes and how she fights uh, to get out of there. And one theme that changes about the representation of Eastern sexuality, particularly after the Iranian Revolution, is instead of being, instead of the East being the land of sexual excess and even sexual liberation, you know, you would read travel writers who would go off to the East to discover their own sexuality and so on, now the East is viewed as a site of sexual repression, right? And this is no, in no small part because of the gains of the second wave feminist movement and the emphasis on women as being sexually autonomous beings, but also simultaneously the rise of political Islam in the Middle East, right? And the attack on women's rights uh, in that part of the world. And I see, and you see this uh, shift very clearly in a film like Sex and the City Part Two, which you haven't seen, you just, you don't need to see, just watch this. <laughs> Your first shisha experience. This is very exciting. You put this pipe in your mouth. And suck. You are a natural. In the interest of time, I'm going to pause it there. But what you start to see is this dynamic playing out and the Arab couple that's in the background goes more and more horrified until at one point the man covers the, wom the woman's eyes and so on and so forth. So you see this reversal taking place at this point um, where, of course, the Arabs are now sexually repressed. Um, in fact, this is not just an image that we see in culture. A book called The Arab Mind, you know, because there's only one Arab mind, um, written by Raphael Partai, becomes the basis of the torture that's devised in places like Abu Ghraib, right? It's based on this idea of the sexually repressed Arab man. Um, but at the same time as you have this image of largely working class and lower class Arab men as being sexually repressed, the harem continues to dominate the imagination of filmmakers and television producers. And the very second episode of the show, Homeland, actually has a harem scene, and let's watch it. Raised in Colorado Springs, attended BYU. Interests, finance, travel, men. Stacy Moore, this is Latif bin Walid, Major Domo, for His Highness Prince Farid. Please continue. Would you say you're outgoing or more the quiet type, Stacy? I'd say more outgoing, but definitely social. I like to party, if that's what you mean. Do you drink? I'm not a drinker, per se, if that's what you mean. Stacy, you are interviewing for a job that pays in two years more than most people in this country earn in 20. If you're successful in this interview, you will be required to appear self-possessed, confident, modest, and reticent all at the same time. So stop asking what I mean. Think and answer for yourself. Do you enjoy anal sex? Excuse me. How about other women? 
Sure. Both. Okay. Now there's a lot to be said about each of the clips I'm going to show you, and maybe in discussion we can do it. But you see so many themes being repeated here, right? The idea of the nude from Orientalist paintings is very similar to the way this woman is being positioned in her interview. But what's different is that the person doing the interviewing is a new woman, right? A, a liberated uh, woman who is educated um, and who is instructing this underconfident woman on how to be independent, educated, and sexually uh, adventurous. And of course, the Arab man is still deviant, you know, as is indicated by his preferences. And white women have to be punished, right? In this uh, scene, what happens after this scene is that the woman doing the interviewing uh, is going to be killed for falling in love with an Arab man. And the person trying to do the saving is not a man in this instance, it's a woman. It's uh, Carrie Mathis, who is the protagonist of the show Homeland. And Carrie Mathis really stands in for the American nation. Here, quite literally, right? You see her red hijab, you see her blue gown, and of course her face is white. And you see very clearly the clash of civilizations uh, rhetoric. We value women. We have women who are agents who act upon the world. And on the other hand, you have these women who are faceless, who are nameless, who are even who are not just oppressed, but even somewhat threatening. And here is this woman who is inviting us by looking back at us to go on this crusade to vanquish the Islamic threat. Now, imperialist feminism in the War on Terror era has a lot. Uh, in common with the imperialist feminism of the 19th century, but there are many new aspects as well. The Lord Cromers and Lord Curzons are replaced by women, sometimes elite women, people like Hillary Clinton or Condoleezza Rice, but the expectations of normative femininity surprisingly remain the same. So if you look at somebody like Hillary Clinton, she is very pro-empire, pro-interventionist and so on, and her feminism comes out largely when she's somewhere else. A famous speech that she gives, she gives in Beijing in 1995, where she says that human rights, women's rights are human rights, and that's a term that starts to get used. But that was done somewhere else. Back home, she remains the dutiful wife of a husband who is cheating on her, and she stands by her man, and so on. So normative, the expectations of normative femininity remain the same as much as they change. And today, too, we have native collaborators. One such person is Ayan Hirsi Ali, who I think has done more to bolster and legitimize the language of imperialist feminism than anybody else. Here's Ayan Hirsi Ali. Her latest book, which was just released, is called Heretic. And uh, as the subtitle says, she argues that Islam must change and join the quote-unquote modern world. I would argue she's the Qasim Amin of today, right? Um, and she has peddled the clash of civilizations argument, saying that the West is enlightened, and she tells her own story as the story through the clash of civilizations. And my critique of her is not so much that she's somebody who lied on her asylum papers in the Netherlands and so on, immigrants do that, but that she is an opportunist. She is somebody who knows how to tell a story to endear herself to the powerful and secure fame and fortune for herself. And the stories that she tells, of course, lines up perfectly with the imperialist feminist uh, narrative. And I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm not going to say very much about her. But suffice it to say that recently she made a claim on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. She was there promoting her book where she says, quote, if you look at 70% of the violence in the world today, Muslims are responsible. And this is what she's done. She's tried to portray Islam as this uniquely violent religion that must be vanquished and so on. And of course, this claim is nonsense. It's utter rubbish. Um, and the journalist Max Blumenthal actually uh, checks up on the statistic and goes to the source. It's a British human rights agency uh, whom she's quoting, and they say, no, we never put out the statistic, um, which, uh, you know, of course makes sense. I mean, and in saying this, by the way, I'm not trying to undermine the atrocities committed by groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda and so on. Certainly they are violent and certainly they commit violence, but the amount of violence they commit 
pales in significance actually to the amount of killing that the US has been responsible for. Because in the very same week that Hersi Ali is talking about 70% of violence and so on being uh, the responsibility of uh, Muslims, the Nobel Prize winning uh, group, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, put out a report, a very well researched report, um, stating that the U.S. is responsible for killing 1.3 million people in its war on terror in just three countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. They don't use Yemen um, or any of the other countries. And in fact, they say this is a very conservative figure because if you actually did uh, the tallying, the, the figure would be closer to 2 million. But of course, Hersi Ali doesn't want to talk about these inconvenient truths. Instead, her whole claim is this clash of civilizations and Islam as being uniquely violent uh, and so forth, and a force that must be defeated by uh, the West. Um, she actually shot to fame uh, with a documentary that she made called Submission, which is the story of these four women and the sexual and physical humiliation that they face. And you know, I, I was going to show a clip, but I don't have the time. But the question that one can legitimately ask is, but what of the real suffering and oppression of Muslim women, right? How do we think about this? How do we write about this? And how do we do it in a way that does not fall into the imperialist feminist narrative? And I'm going to try to provide a framework from which to think about this question. First of all, I do want to say that absolutely women in Iran, women in Pakistan, women in Yemen, and so on, do face oppression. Um, but I think the better way to talk about this is comparatively. And let me give an example. So in the case of Pakistan, every year 1,000 women are killed in what are called honor killings. I don't like that term because it assumes that somehow religion and culture are solely responsible for the murder of women. It doesn't address the larger economic, political, and social conditions. But at any rate, in Pakistan, 1,000 women are killed by family members every year, and Pakistan is a country of 140 million people. In the US, we are a country of 300 million people. 1,500 women are killed by spouses or boyfriends every year. The Justice Department actually puts out a figure. It's calculated the number of women who are killed by intimate partners between 2002 and 2012, and that number is 15,462. In fact, if you do the math every day, three to four women are killed by intimate partners right here in this country, and yet, we don't know about this, right? Most of us don't know the names of these women, much less this is you know, not part of the national conversation. And I want to argue this is exactly how the imperialist feminist narrative sustains itself by highlighting the violence against women elsewhere and blaming their backward culture for it by ignoring the very real problems that women face right here in the United States. So let me come to a close with this. If we are to reject imperialist feminism, what can we replace it with? And how can we speak more ethically about the oppression of women, both here and elsewhere? I think we need a policy of transnational feminist solidarity. There are many scholars and feminists who have written beautifully about transnational feminism, people like Chandra Mohanty, Indrapal Greval, and so on. I'm just going to highlight two aspects. One, as I said earlier, is that we have to take a comparative analysis, one that rejects cultural reductionism, uh, the kind of tendency to blame Islam for everything. And this is not only the work of people like Ayan Hirsi Ali, um, even non-governmental organizations, NGOs, some well-intentioned NGOs, often quickly jump to blame Islam and cultures. And there is a justified critique, I think, that has been made in some quarters that NGOs have become the new missionaries um, of the current era. It's not true of everyone, but certainly the well-funded um, uh, ones of them. You may ask, does religion play a part? Yes. Christianity, for instance, has been part of the attack on women's rights in the US. It has fueled the backlash against the women's movement. And political Islam, the rise of political Islam, certainly plays a part in the attack on women's rights in Muslim-majority countries. But religion itself doesn't do anything. That is, religion can be both the voice of the oppressor and the voice of the oppressed. 
Just as there are progressive interpretations of Christianity, there are Muslim feminists who point to various passages in the Quran where women are actually presented as the equal of men and where women are, are given the right to own, uh, to inheritance, and we have to resist the impulse to sort of blame uh, Islam for everything. Let me give you one more quick example. In fall of 2003, sexual violence and trafficking in Iraq of girls and women actually rose dramatically. Now, the lazy explanation for this is to say Islam is to blame. After all, for centuries we've been told that Islam turns women into sexual slaves. In fact, that's not true. Uh, it's patently wrong. Um, a major explanatory factor for why we saw this rise in um, sexual slavery is because 72% of salaried women in Iraq had government jobs. And when the entire government and various ministries were shut down after the US invasion of that country, women lost their jobs. And so the only way in which they could earn a subsistence was by selling their bodies. So you see from this example that what we need is a structural analysis, an analysis of the conditions. And when we do that, we see that there are all sorts of other factors uh, that are responsible, empire, uh, neoliberal capitalism, and so forth. Um, finally, I want to argue that women in this country, as I've said repeatedly, do not benefit from the imperialist feminist framework. When men are trained in the military to be ruthless killers, their wives, their partners, and their fellow soldiers also pay a price. Domestic violence, by the way, in military families is much higher than in civilian families. And as of 2012, 26,000 cases of rape and sexual assault took place in the, in the military. And only keep in mind, only one in seven victims report these attacks. So women everywhere pay a price for uh, this narrative and for these politics. And so I will come to a close with this, and that is we need to look at the actual conditions that produce sexual and physical violence against women. We need to do a structural analysis, and this then is the basis for solidarity, a recognition that the oppression of women everywhere is tied to the oppression of women right here, and we need to build solidarity, empathy, rather than pity, and contempt from women in other parts of the world. Thank you.